Welcome to the Golden Coast of Georgia. The Golden Coast is the eastern shore of Georgia nestled midway between Savannah, Georgia and Jacksonville, Florida. On this trip, we'll be visiting St. Simon Island and Jekyll Island. They are known for their salt marshes, live oaks draped in Spanish moss, miles of beaches and sandy dunes. Every night we'll stay in a new hotel so you can see as many of the stays as possible and we'll show you what we like. We'll also show you a few other great places we wish we would have stayed. We cover options from lower cost to the high-end resorts from family and adults only. Remember, we only show you the places we recommend. We'll review where we ate and what we loved about the food. One thing we don't do on this channel is waste your time with the places that did not make the cut. Our first stop was the Sea Palms Resort. Now we picked this place because we decided to come here last minute and I was looking for a reasonable place just to spend the night. It's always hard to find the lower cost room and I think we found a gem here. So we're gonna show you the Sea Palms Resort and I hope you like it as much as we did. I did some research trying to find the perfect place for our first dinner and I found this great brewery called Barrier Island Brewing. Now the picture looked fabulous, but I wasn't really sure when we got there if it was gonna really meet the standards, cause I have pretty high standards. And honestly, this place was phenomenal. I found out as we walked around the island and talked to different people that some of the locals still hadn't even been here yet. I highly recommend the place. It is not your typical brew food. It is amazing, um, elevated food, and I think it's a great stop been wanting to come to the Sea Island Resort, the Cloisters and the Lodge and the whole family of resorts for some time. So I was really excited when we finally got the chance to come here. And actually it was the whole reason we ended up coming up to St. Simon Islands. So there's three different parts to this resort. One is the Cloisters, which is the older area or the more traditional. Then you have the beachfront resort, the, and that's where we stayed. And then we have the lodge, which is really a golfing community. So um, let's take a look at this. And if you're looking for Georgia hospitality and um, feeling like you're part of the rich and famous, this is the place to come stay. At the Cloisters seems to be the place that you'd stay if you're a couple maybe, um, or uh, friends traveling. It's kind of a more refined area, I would say, as opposed to the beach club, which is really focused on families. It's got great things for the kids to do. There's the bowling alley and the arcade all right there. They've got, you know, easy food options at the pubs for the family and, and then the whole area for the kids just to run around. So I would say the beach club really is focused on the families, wouldn't you? More families and kids. Yeah. 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 And By a the great way, they, place to bring the kids. A the kids can place. live in they, the arcade and they can just play and play and play and play and play. Yeah. Because it's all free play the whole time. Yeah. You don't have to worry about giving them a hundred dollar bill to, to go uh, play games. Yeah. In the morning, we popped over to the Cloisters to have um, their complimentary coffee and danishes and we were able to sit in the atrium. They also have uh, free newspapers, New York Times, USA Today, so if you like to get caught up on your papers, you can do that while you're there. The atrium's this beautiful spot, birds singing, beautiful pictures, the ceiling's amazing, and um, it's a really great place to sit together and figure out what you're gonna do for the day. This is the lodge at Sea Island. We're staying at the Cloisters. If you're into golf, this is the property you would want to stay in. Here's the golf course, looking out over the water. Beautiful views. When I go on 
on vacation, having a great meal is very important to me. I hate, hate, hate to spend money on food and let it be crappy food, fried food, overdone food, food people cook that nobody cares about. Um, so I spend a lot of time trying to figure out the right places to eat. We found tonight the Georgia Sea Grill and the service was impeccable. You can tell they really cared about their food and the flavors in their food, and I highly recommend it as a place to go for dinner. Georgia Sea Grill. I had the salmon tonight. It was very fresh, very delicious, and cooked to perfection. Not only, I not always get a good cooked salmon. Sometimes you get overcooked, sometimes undercooked. This was cooked perfect and is very fresh. You can tell that this restaurant really takes care and takes pride in their food. On vacation, I always enjoy browsing the local shops just to see what they have that's different, any local things that we can pick up. And one of the things I always actually buy from every place we go to is a Christmas ornament. And um, if you look at our decorating the tree video, you'll see how every year we collect things and then when we put them on the tree, we look at what we've gotten and have the memories of all the different places that we've been. But St. Simon's Island has a really great um, little downtown area with quite a few shops that you can browse. It's a good way to spend maybe an hour, an hour and a half. If you really like to shop, maybe three hours. Um, but it's right there at the pier and um, it's quite a nice way to spend the afternoon. So apparently, what we're visiting here is Fort Frederica. Fort Frederica has in there, um, it was a military town that was established by Oglethorpe, who um, was trying to protect the area from the Spanish. And so it was a military town and in its heyday had up to 1,500 people. General Oglethorpe chose a site for the fort. It was high ground on a river bend where the cannon could hold off Spanish ships upstream or downstream. Flanking marshes gave protection against the land attack and there was plenty of timber for building fortifications. The fort became the center of military operations along the southern frontier of the British colonies. From here Oglethorpe launched offenses against Spanish at St. Augustine. The Spanish invaded Georgia in 1742 were returned back before they reached Frederica. The fort was eventually leveled, not by the Spanish, but by time and the elements. Archaeological excavations in the 1950s confirmed the locations of Palisades walls and building earthworks have been partially reconstructed. After visiting Fort Frederica, we popped by Christ Church. And Christ Church is actually an Episcopal church that began its, as a mission in 1736 and it would become one of the first Episcopal dioceses in Georgia in 1823. No trip to Georgia is complete without a stop at a Southern barbecue place. And we found one that's called Southern Soul Restaurant. And I am telling you, this place is phenomenal. In order to try everything, we ordered the sampler platter, which had some ribs on it, and it had some brisket on it, and it had some pulled pork on it, and then we just got a side of um, potatoes and hush puppies, which were phenomenal. And then, of course, nothing would be complete without a southern sweet tea, and so we had to get that too. I personally thought that the ribs were amazing, but Paul said that he loved the brisket the best. If you're going down here you need to get your southern barbecue on, stop at Southern Soul Barbecue. When I'm on vacation, I just love, love to learn the history of the area. So one of the places we stopped was the St. Simons Island Lighthouse, which was built in 1810. The original lighthouse was 75 feet tall and was octagonal and then had a 10-foot oil burning lamp on top. During the Civil War, the forces used it as a naval blockade on the coast. And you'll be able to see when we get up here why the lighthouse is so important off of St. Simons Island because you can see the shoals everywhere. Like if you look out as we pan around here, you'll be able to see that the shoals are um, 
really breaking very, very shallow and would be very treacherous for a boat coming in. In 1862, the Union troops came in and the Confederate soldiers actually had to abandon the area, so they actually destroyed the original lighthouse. Then, the government came in and constructed a new lighthouse in 1872. This lighthouse is very cool because the light inside of it was really special for its time. It was designed by a Frenchman and it has a lens in there that it still is operational today. It projects four beams of light and flashes every 60 seconds. In 1934, electricity replaced the kerosene. It takes 129 steps to get to the top. You're rewarded with this amazing view of the coastline and the downtown area. It's a 360 around the top of the lighthouse. You can see the shoals out there. And I think about what it must have been like to be the house, the light keeper there, and to have to light that every night and make sure it was going so that the ships didn't hit the shore. So we bought a ticket to the Homefront Museum as part of the lighthouse. And I was kind of like, OK, we'll go look at it. But what really, a World War II museum on, in America? I wasn't really sure what it was going to be like. But I have to tell you, it was one of the things I really, really, really enjoyed. Just again, because I'm a history buff, I enjoy learning about it. So the St. Simons Coast Guard Station on East Beach was constructed by Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 as part of the Public Works Administration projects that he took on at that time. The first watch was on April 1st, 1937. And the beach was much closer to the station at that time. The original mission was to rescue swimmers and assist boats in distress, etc. But then World War II came along. And the most significant life-saving effort in the station's history was on April 8th in 1942, when two merchant ships, the SS Esso Baton Rouge and the SS Oklahoma, were torpedoed by German U-boats off the coast of St. Simons Island, and it killed 22 crew. I didn't even know that German U-boats were that close to the United States. There's also history there about the shipbuilding that they did in Brunswick and how fast the ships were made, which was really incredible in the speed. And what their plan basically was is they were, they were gonna build the ships faster than the U-boats could sink them. And they were building these ships that were six, seven, eight stories tall and completing them like in a week's time. That was really amazing. Anyway, so I did enjoy our visit to the Homefront World War II Museum. And if you've got the time to do it, I think it's really worth the trip. Once we stayed beachfront at the Sea Island Beach Club, I wanted to go ahead and try another beachfront location just to do in comparison. So we chose the King and Prince Beach and Golf Resort. restaurant kind of tucked into a place maybe you wouldn't expect when we got inside though you can really tell that they care about their food they take the time to present it well um, to make sure the flavors are good and we found some really special dishes when we were there and so we ordered a round of different things um, we started off with a root salad which um, I found phenomenal uh, I told it was so good that I actually recommended it to the lady sitting next to me. Paul decided to try the shrimp scampi. It wasn't a traditional shrimp scampi like you think of. And we got it with like an order of bread to really sop up all that good stuff in the bottom there. But um, that was actually very, very good also. And then the third thing we ordered was the pizza. And it was a pizza. It was actually a little bit of a sweet pizza with some figs on it and maybe um, the cheese and stuff. So maybe it was, um, if you have a sweet thing, we kind of ate it as a dessert pizza. So for us, it was perfect and it made for a great meal. And this is a place we do recommend you find when you're on St. Simon's Island. While we were in the area, 
we decided to check out the Hotel Simone. I had seen it on the internet before we got there and it was an adult only location. And now I really, really wish that we would have stayed there. I think that um, this is has the feel of luxury. The location was only like a block and a half from the beach. There were some restaurants right nearby there. And I think the service and the luxury and the boutique feel of the hotel make it a real spectacular choice for St. Simon Island. to be heading over to Jekyll Island and we just checked out of the hotel and we wanted to kind of have a brunch right now and as I was looking around somebody had recommended to us the Palmer's Village Cafe and so we decided it'd be a good place to try for a brunch. It's sort of an eggs benedict with um, a crab cake and grits on the bottom and I have to say it was amazing. I actually ate every bit of it. And then Paul opted for the special for the day, which was an avocado toast with scallops on it. Scallops are a local Georgia food, and um, a lot of the restaurants have it in their dishes. And so Paul decided to try that for breakfast, and um, he also cleaned his plate too. So we give this place two thumbs up and recommend you try a breakfast or brunch there. Jekyll Island has miles of secluded beaches with no homes on them at all. And Jekyll Island Club is a place where the Gilded Age had its heyday. The actual club was built back in 1888 when the Rockefellers purchased Jekyll Island and built the Jekyll Island Club and then became homes to such amazing people in our history as the Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, and the Carnegies, and the Pulitzers. They would come to Jekyll Island in January and stay escaping the cold winters up north through March. So happened that the weekend we decided to come to the Jekyll Island Club there was a shrimp and grits festival going on lucky us I do enjoy a good festival they actually had three live stages and then uh, a shrimp and grits cook-off which was honestly the food was pretty good the festival came with the usual number of vendors um, selling things as well as a shrimp and grits cook-off and then finally, on the first night, live fireworks that we enjoyed from sitting outside at the Jekyll Island Club on the porch. And the Jekyll Island Club, being full of Southern hospitality, brought us all a free champagne toast as we um, enjoyed the sunset and listened to the live music. So this is interesting. This talks about the original purchasers of, the, of Jekyll Island. And it turns out that the original purchasers came from the St. Simons Island, which was called Sapello at the time. And four Frenchmen came over from there and actually purchased this island. And um, that was in 1791. And then Dubignon, which you, D -U -B -I, was in the French military and he fought in India for the British for four years before coming over to here. And he became the sole owner of Jekyll Island. And Dubignon is the guy who Rockefeller came in and purchased the island from in like 18, like 100 years later, in like 1890s. So that's an interesting history. And then here's the cemetery where some of the Dubignon families buried. So let's go check that out. So Christophe Dubignon was born in 1739. 
and at the age of 10, his family sent him off to work for the West India Trading Company. Well, if you remember back in school, we always heard about the West India Trading Company. They owned everything and traded across the globe. Well, at 10 years old, he went and for, to work for them and became a sailor and um, worked with, for them until that company was disbanded in 1769. Then um, he became part of the French army and was living in a colony off of Africa which is also interesting. And there he met and married his wife in 1778. So he was quite old at the time he got married, especially for back then, he was almost 40 years old. Then they went back to France and raised a family, which was very fine, but that didn't last long because um, in 1789, the French Revolution came and the French Revolution, because he was now well-to-do and was making money, he and his family were uh, fled France for their safety. And that's why they ended up coming over here to Georgia, which is really interesting, and settled on Sapello Island, which is St. Simmons Island now. And then the four Frenchmen bought this island later on, which is Jekyll Island. The English, Horton, who was actually the sheriff of Herefordshire in England, interestingly enough, decided to come on an adventure and come over to America. That's how he got here, and he came with Oglethorpe in 1735. Then he created the plantation. He was given 500 acres here, and the 500 acres he was given because he paid for his passage to America. And as a, as a payback, they gave him 500 acres. And they told him that he had to bring 10 indentured servants for every 50 acres. So that means he had to have 100 indentured servants working here, and had to have 20% of the land producing before the 20 years. That was, that was t before 10 years. So he had to have 20% of the land producing before 10 years. So that was their agreement. So he now had the whole land producing. In the meantime, Dubignon and his families settled over in Sapello Island and then came from Sapello Island and bought this island in 1791. And that's the way it went down. That's the history of Jekyll Island. And then from Dubignon, the Rockefellers actually purchased the island in the eight late 1800s and that's the way that's the way Jekyll Island became settled. Bold italic names are buried here. So the kids of Dubignon are buried here, two of them, and some of their kids. Any of the tombs are in the ground because of floating. Floating. But anyway, good. Here we are at the Horton House. Take a look at it. We can see what it is. So it says here that William Horton traveled to Georgia with James Oglethorpe in 1735. And he actually paid for his own passage, whereas most people came for free. He paid for his passage, and in return, he received 500 acres. And that's right here. He came by himself, he was considered an adventurer, and left his wife and two kids in England until they decided to come with him after he settled and built this plantation. So in return for that, he needed to bring with him indentured servants who would actually work the land, and he also agreed to have the land producing within 10 years of taking it over. And this is what's left right now of his plantation home, so let's go check it out. Cool. He completed this building in 1743. It was his second home on the island, so he built himself a temporary shelter and then built this one as the... Um, Thing. The original home was made of wood and burned by the Spanish troops in 1742. We met a nice couple of ladies at the Jekyll Island Club, and they had mentioned that they were staying over at the campgrounds. So I thought, hey, let's go check out the campgrounds and see what they're like. So we drove up the road, which is only maybe three or four miles, I'm guessing, from the Jekyll Island Club. Um, we found these great campgrounds, um, and it's busy. The campgrounds are really full right now, probably because that Shrimp and Grits Festival is going on. But you can see it's a lovely location with the old oaks, and it would be very shady in the summer um, when it could be a little bit hotter in Georgia and um, they have some nice facilities there so looks like the campgrounds might be a good option if you're into the natural part of Jekyll Island. Okay so here we are in Driftwood Beach. Yeah, Driftwood Beach. Like 
I heard this was cool, but I, honestly, this is crazy amazing. You have to see it to believe it. It's a, it is incredible. Yeah. 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 So so what happened here is this used to all be part of the forest, and these are all uh, live oaks. I'm sure these are all live oaks. Uh, a, a live oak forest, and the beach encroached up into the forest, which caused them to die and, and fall over. And then uh, what's happening is, is the beach is actually wearing away up into the forest. Okay. So Driftwood Beach is amazing. Like they said it was cool, but I didn't get it. So you come here and apparently what the story is, is this used to all be part of the forest. And one of the things Jekyll Island is known for is these huge live oaks. They're beautiful live oaks. Well, it seems that the beach started coming into the forest where all these live oaks were, and then these live oaks could no longer survive here and they started deteriorating and falling over and becoming driftwood. So now it's called Driftwood Beach and it's a, a sight to see. It's a beautiful um, natural sculptures in the sand. So come check out Driftwood Beach. just checked out of the Jekyll Island Club and we're heading over to the West End to kind of do maybe the opposite end of the spectrum. So Jekyll Island was built in 1888 and is all about the history and the West End was actually built in the year maybe 2020. So the West End is brand new, decorated very modern, has all the amenities that you want, um, super comfortable, very spacious, so let's check out and see what it's like. As far as the beach goes, I think it's better than St. Simon's Island. Nicely, easy to walk on. And look at this, miles, Paul. Like. So this is the West End, and this is where we're staying, and we're in right in one of those corner rooms over there, which is really nice, right, right there. And then over here, though, is the Jekyll Ocean Club. So this is actually part of the hotel that we were at, the, the Jekyll Island Club, which is the old hotel, but this is their beach club version, which is, also seems really nice too. We chose the Westin just for something different, um, a little bit newer, but obviously that's a new place too. So I think either way, it's good. And the other thing is that if you come down this way, over in here somewhere, keep going, yeah, that way, the convention center's right here too. So you've got the convention center, you've got um, another little hotel which is new called, I think, Home to Go or something. I forget the name of it, but that would be a less expensive option, but it's not on the beach. And then the Westin and the Ocean Jekyll Club. But you can see there's not a lot here. There's no homes along the beach. There's no properties that are oceanfront. So I can't imagine that this place would get hugely crowded. I do think that right now the tide is really out because all the sand that we're standing on right now is very, very firm. And as we come back to the hotel, which we'll do, and um, before we do that, it looks like you can go for miles that, I mean, miles that way. And you can go for miles that way. Jekyll Island is 5,700 acres. And it used to be privately owned, but now it's turned and it was bought by the state of Georgia in like 1949. So in actual fact, all of Jekyll Island is part of a state park and you have to have special regulations to build here. And because of that, that's why you don't see any beachfront homes and, and none of this is going on. So this is going to remain very uncrowded, very pristine, very much more natural than when you go like to St. Simon Islands. And as we're walking back to the hotel right now, you can see the sand is all really packed and it looks like that this is part of low tide, like the sand, the, the waves may come all the way up to pretty close to the where you walk onto the beach in high tide. So you wanna make sure that if you're planning on coming to the beach here that you plan on coming 
um, during when the tides may be a little bit more out. Maybe could a real good jogging sleep? beach too. You could really jog oh, along yeah, here really well really because great. it's because it's really firm and tight. Well, look at you can see the people over there. They're walking their kid with their um, with a stroller stroller on the sand. No problems at all. Inside the Weston is a little um, Jekyll Island Beach Village, they call it. And it's really just a few restaurants, um, a shop or two. But what they do have there is a great little grocery store. So if you want to get stocked up on things to take to your room or to your campground, this is a great place to stop and do that, this little beach village on Jekyll Island. So it's Saturday and I had heard that the Georgia Bulldogs were playing Tennessee. And so this was like number one against number three and I thought, what a really fun place to watch the game. I'm actually a big football fan. And so I thought, well, let's go watch a little college um, football. And we found this great little place called the Wee Pub. It was right in this beach village and lots of Georgia fans. So go dogs. So if you're looking for a place to get away, we do recommend the Golden Coast of Georgia. These barrier islands that we visited, St. Simons Island and Jekyll Island, really offer an amazing combination of food and nature and a great places to stay, to make your vacation everything that you'd really want it to be when you're trying to relax and unwind and do something different. So come to the Golden Coast, and see what we saw and enjoy life.